right, so this image over here, uh, it's a satellite image of uh, plumes which are coming, smoke plumes, okay. I just wanted to share it with you because at some point in time, I will talk to you about satellite data and some of the uh, recent applications of satellite for um, air quality management, okay. Uh, I think there's another one here. Here's another one. Here you see this particular place where something has happened. And I'm not too sure, but I think this is um, from the 9-11 disaster. So this probably is New York, I think. I'm not too sure. Okay? So that's the smoke coming. This is the plume. And you can actually see it. Uh, now this image, it actually is an image. So you can see the smoke. And it's a clear day. There's no cloud, so probably you can see it. But there'll be days when there'll be clouds and this will not be visible. So there are ways to be able to bypass some of those noise issues and then look at the pollutant sources and the locations. Okay. Um, uh, this is another one of my uh, favorite images. It actually shows uh, two different uh, chimneys or two different sources, point sources. Uh, for one, the wind seems to be in this direction, this direction. For the other one, it seems to be in this direction, okay? So wind is, uh, when we measure wind at uh, 10 meter height at, in a meteorological station, it is only indicative of the wind speed at the surface, okay? Uh, a few hundred meters above, and the direction of the wind can change. So it's very important to have this understanding of meteorology as well, so that we can accordingly uh, take into account some of these effects during modeling. Okay, here's an image of uh, what a typical um, sampler, air pollution sampler looks like in the field. Uh, it would invariably have, uh, I, I'm not too sure, it looks like a PM 2.5 head over here. A lot of times they would have a high volume sampler as well as sometimes they'll have a MET station to be able to get the local meteorological data as well. Okay, so this is what it looks like in the field. A lot of times because of security reasons, you have to house it in a chamber like this, and close it and lock it and uh, you have to take precautions because a lot of times that becomes an issue when we're dealing with field sampling. Okay, so those are just some um, trailers and um, some, some things to fill in the time so that all of you can settle in, okay? It takes about five to 10 minutes for people to settle in. So this is probably good entertainment for that duration. All right, so let's begin with the lecture six. And uh, before we begin, let's just review what we have done in the previous five lectures. Uh, in the first lecture, we set up the context and we had a pre-course quiz or pre-course feedback. Uh, followed by lecture two, where we looked at concentrations, we looked at the national ambient air quality standards. Um, uh, we looked at, uh, in lecture three, dispersion, mixing, stability, how particles or how uh, pollutants once emitted into the atmosphere, what is the fate of these um, pollutants, what happens to them, uh, what is the strategy that we use to be able to disperse these, uh, depending on the meteorology, depending on the height of the chimney, etc. And then we need to be able to understand the impact of this. So ground level concentrations are also uh, estimated using uh, Gaussian plume models and similar models. In the next lecture, we actually distinguished between gases and particles as ants and elephants. And we uh, actually defined what is PM10, what is PM2.5, some of the sources of these elephants and dinosaurs. In the last lecture that we did, we actually looked at how to measure these pollutants particulate pollutants, and I'd given the methods for carbon monoxides, oxides of sulfur, oxides of nitrogen. These are standard methods that are available, wet chemistry by and large. A lot of times nowadays they also have automated instruments, etc. So if one is setting up a laboratory, one is setting, setting up a, a monitoring station, then you know, these become important. But I think it's important for students to know uh, what does it take for them to be able to measure these pollutants. Criteria pollutants, we're only talking about criteria pollutants right now. When it comes down to industry, there are many, many other pollutants that need to be measured. And then the industry accordingly takes care of whatever the protocols for that are. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, air pollutants, how to control air pollutants. Okay. Um, okay, but before we you know, move on, um, let's take a look. You know, in case today is my last lecture, I may not get a chance to talk to you again tomorrow. And uh, so, you know, maybe a good idea to review your questions in the 
uh, you had uh, in the pre-course feedback, pre-course pre -course feedback that we did. So there were two parts. Part A, which was more to do with how you teach in your college and like, proximity of your college to some of the industry, et cetera, et cetera. But part B was more focused on the specifics of what the syllabus demands and uh, what you teach or you know, what are the things that are clear for you, not clear for you, those kinds of things. Okay? So these were the six uh, questions that we had, or seven questions that we had asked. Again, the last one was contextual. Uh, these um, six questions were more of uh, questions that might be asked during um, the teaching of this course. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to have you uh, open up your notebooks and uh, review uh, these. Uh, or if you don't have those notebooks or if you don't have the sheet of paper, to in any case, go ahead and review these to look to see if you have been able to convert the I do not knows or the ones that you were guessing. Okay? There were some things. We, we said there could be three possible responses. You know it and you say it. You don't know it, but you can make an intelligent guess. So you know, go ahead and make that guess and say that you're guessing it. And third one is you have no clue, and then you say, okay, I really don't know the answer to this question. And we had said that the more ID and case you have, the more relevant this course would be with you. So you know, you have more things so that you can learn from this course. So same thing, you know, comes back to the same thing. So ID and K, if any of your ID and Ks have been now, can you can claim them as I now know, okay? Uh, then great, you know, and if no, then I just opened up, just before coming for the session, I opened up a new Moodle conversation uh, in which I request you that whatever you don't know, even after having gone these lectures, whatever queries you might have, whatever things are not clear for you, uh, please send it. So in some sense, it will also help us in uh, de deciding what kind of assignments and what kind of resources to give you so that if not during these 10 days, at least you have it available uh, the resource to be able to answer these questions. Okay, so I'm going to switch back to that particular slide and hold it for a few seconds uh, so that you can go ahead and uh, actually talk to each other or just go over your notes to see how many of these questions are already answered for you or how many of them are still pending. Okay, so I'm going to be quiet for about two minutes now. So please go ahead and discuss with your uh, partners or you know talk to uh, other people in the room. Okay, go ahead. I'll be back in two minutes. Okay, uh, Netaji Subhash Engineering College, Techno City. Wow. So air pollution we can control by so many instruments we have discussed: electrostatic precipitator, bag house. But compared to the volume of the nature, is it sufficient to make the air clean for our survival? Okay, so yes, the, so the, um, the issue of implementation of a lot of these technologies um, is, remains unresolved or is not at a level at it which should be in India. Uh, but that's the work ahead for us. Uh, and uh, can we you know, bring, bring it to a point of sustainability? That is our commitment. The question is, are we going to be able to do it in the next five years? Or are we going to do it over the next 20 years? Okay, whatever it is, we got to have some plan for it, and some target that each of the cities with a million plus people, uh, which are not in compliance uh, with the air quality standards, we have to committedly take actions to make sure that these cities come in the, come under uh, compliance. Okay, so the Central Pollution Control Board is already doing the work. Uh, the instructions, for example, have already come to Maharashtra Pollution Control Board, uh, where 10 cities have been identified. Uh, to do the studies for the major sources and how best to control them. So this is like this, this, this activity or this mission is at a national level and the work is in progress. And uh, my invitation to you is to look to see uh, which of you know, these cities which might be closest to you or you may be in one of these cities, uh, in what way you can participate and in what way you can contribute uh, to this overall mission. Okay? So uh, I want to move from a level of uh, philosophical aspects or should we, can we, no, of course we need to. There's no issue about it. People's health is at stake. Okay? We need to impact that. The question is uh, for us to discover what would your and my role be. Okay? And you and I being in educational institutes, we have a role to play. If this issue is going to require 20 years time frame, then you and I are not going to be dealing with it 10 years from now or 15 years from now. So we need to be training the next level of, the next generation of, students, next generation of professionals, that's what our focus is over here. Okay? So I'd again like to bring it back to 
the question of in the air pollution module, if there are things that are not clear for you, would you please ask some questions? Okay, please go ahead. We talk about <laughs> catalytic converter. Yes. But catalytic converter is not <laughs> properly used in our country, I think, because we have a lot of automobile emissions. Yes. That should be prevented. So catalytic converter <laughs> should be introduced in the full level. But that is not done yet. We talk about it, but we don't implement it. Okay. All right, very good. So that's a you know a good thought to spend some time with, and I don't have an answer to that right now. Um, so uh, we will you know stay engaged. I will send some information on catalytic converters and uh, what are the you know manufacturers expected to do about it. Okay, you may also want to go up and Google some of this for yourself. Okay. Uh, uh, is there any separate mechanism or instrument which we can use to measure the concentration of particulate matter in more. Yes, yes, it's done routinely. It's in fact one of the US EPA methods. So um, you should just go put the same words that you told me. If you put them up in Google, you'll actually find the method. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, yeah. So I'm, I'm, you know, I just want you to know that a lot of questions that you ask are questions that even I have. Okay, and uh, what I typically do is I'll just go punch in these keywords on Google. And up comes the answer, you know, typically more than what I'm actually looking for. You know, a lot of times I think I have a great idea, and then I go to the Google and find out that it's not such a great idea, but it's been tested and tried out many times before I, you know, conceived of it. So, um, good. So, yes, there are methods. The answer to your question is yes, there are methods available for that. Okay, I'll move on to, so thank you, Netaji Subhash. I'm move on, moving on to the next location now. Okay, Valchand Institute of Technology, Sholapur, how are you? Good morning. Morning, excellent. All right, anybody got a question? Anything that is not resolved yet? I want to have some output of this program. So, so many pollutions are taking place throughout the world, also in our local cities. Air pollution is there, water pollution is there, soil pollution is there. So, what, what preventive measures that has to be mandatory for the government to pass the bill so that all these pollutions can be eradicated in the very next few years. Thank you. Okay, very good. So, um, I just want you to know that a lot of times this whole subject of pollution gets very emotional. Okay, uh, we want it to so get be solved, you know, yesterday. All right. Um, so, uh, sometimes people have even said that the developing countries uh, do not have to go through the same mistakes that the developed countries have gone, okay? Um, so, there isn't like a magic wand, so to say, which I can just wave and say everything will be fine. Uh, work needs to be done, and uh, there are plans in place, there are laws for sure in place. Um, I don't know, your answer is as good as mine, or my answer is as good as yours in terms of uh, can this be done or should this be done? Of course it can be done. Should it be done? Of course it should be done. Uh, the question is, what is it that you and I are going to take on as our roles so that this can be fulfilled? And again, coming back to the context of this particular course, this particular training, is that you and I need to be partners in training the next generation of professionals. Okay? so. Any more specific questions about air pollution? Please go ahead. Sir, we have learnt about watershed, but what is an air shed? Good. So, what is a watershed? Watershed is where we can uh, uh, store the water so that it can be used for the further uses. When it rains, we can uh, use that and store it and use for the. The barren lands can be used for the watershed. Excellent. So the same thing we do for air also. You throw the air, throw the bad air wherever we want. You take any air and put it in that shed. As long as it is of but influence to you and me, that's an air shed. Okay? But some kind of a some so kind of an artificial boundary that you would create to say, okay, this is the volume of air that is going to be affected by the pollutants. This is the volume of air that is going to impact a particular population. This is the volume of air which can be ventilated in a certain time frame. Okay? So the same abstraction wise, it is the same as watershed. It's just that the kind of boundaries that would, one would expect on a 
land water kind of a interface, you don't have that kind of a boundary in air. Okay? But it's just, you know, if you if you were to take uh, your city and you put a hemisphere on top of it, okay, and say, okay, this is my air shed, and sometimes you can expand it vertically, uh, horizontally, sometimes you have to expand it vertically depending on the terrain, etc. But that's an air shed. You're looking at a particular volume, what's going to be the quality of air in that volume. Okay, so that's an air shed. Okay, so um, I am going to now expect that you will know what is air pollution. If not, then the two weeks that we have after the pollution, after this training is over, that you will do the work for this, okay? What are the sources of air pollution? What is typical ambient particle size distribution? You know this now, the three modes. What are the meteorological factors which affect air quality of a region? You know that now. How is air quality managed in an air shed? We'll talk a little more about this. What are the ways to control industrial? This is what we're going to talk about today, okay? So let me move on now. So the learning objective for today is that you'll know how to explain the principles and methods for the control of particulate as well as gaseous air pollutants, okay? This is much of chemical engineering. So if you have background in chemical engineering or if in your college you have a department of chemical engineering, then maybe a good idea to kind of open that conversation with that department and see what resources might be available locally for you, okay? So this is a summary, okay? I'll describe this, but this is a summary. At the end of the lecture, these are the things that, these are the different uh, aspects that we need to know. For particulate matter, for particulate matter, there are four or five different, different ways of controlling the emissions. One is if the particle is large enough that it'll settle by gravitation, you have settling chambers. All you have is basically a chamber in which you introduce the dirty gas, provide enough time for these particles to settle out, and then the clean air goes out. Straightforward, not much design other than the gravitational settling rate and the time that is required for it to settle out. When particles get smaller, it gets difficult to settle. So therefore, you use something like a cyclone. Everybody knows what a cyclone is from a, a weather perspective, but from an um, air pollution control perspective or a chemical engineering perspective, it's basically, I'll talk about that, it's a cylinder in which you introduce the the dirty gas tangentially, and the particles are thrown out by inertia because of centrifugal force. Scrubbers, you actually make contact with water. We'll talk about that. Electrostatic precipitators, where you actually charge the particles and remove them in an electrical field. Filters, where you actually use a fa fabric filter to be able to remove particles. So those are for particulate matter. And then for gases, you basically use the fact that some gases have an affinity or have solubility in water, and therefore it can be absorbed. Some places, especially for organics, which have an affinity for carbon, you can do adsorption. Sometimes you burn these hydrocarbons, and sometimes you use membrane separation. So we will talk about each one of these a little bit. Okay? So for air pollution control for particulate matter, if the particles are large in size, you could use settling chambers. If they are greater than about 25 micrometers, then you may have to use some kind of a cyclone and so on, so I'll just move on. Okay, so gravitational settling is like settling of dust, okay? If you go out on the road and you pick up particles from the dust, from the soil, and you throw them into the air, you'll actually see a lot of particles stay in the, in the atmosphere, stay in the air as a cloud, but a large number of them settle out, okay? So if the particles are large, they will settle out, smaller particles tend to remain in the, in the air for much longer time. So they're typically good for particles which are greater than 100 micrometers, which is about the diameter of your hair, okay? But that size particles settle out quickly. Uh, the settling rate, the settling rate under normal conditions, atmospheric conditions, temperature conditions, for 100 micrometers is about 25 centimeters a second. For 10 micrometers, it is 0.3, which is 3 millimeters a second. And for 1 micrometers, it is really small. So one of the things I do in the class is, I, on the board, I'd make three, in three different parts. I put a 100 micrometer particle, one circle. I put a one micrometer particle somewhere in the middle of the board. And I put a one, sorry, a 10 micrometer, and a one micrometer towards the end. And I say, okay, after every 15 minutes, we will monitor where this particular particle has reached vertically, okay? And 
for you know the larger particle, it tends to fall very quickly. So even before 15 minutes, it would have settled out of the room. But one micrometer particle, even by the end of the class, has hardly moved a few centimeters. Okay? That gives them a sense of that smaller particles tend to remain in the atmosphere for a longer time. Larger particles settle out. So if you have a very dusty gas stream, then it's a good idea, especially like if you're dealing with solid handling like coal or cement or some other. You have large particles which can actually be settled out by using a settling chamber. Now these are, you know, for example, cement or coal. Uh, this is actual, you know, it's not waste. It's actually money. You know, if you can recover the cement, or if you can re recover the coal, then it can be used. So gravitational settlers is a first step in controlling particulate matter. Um, and that's really because you're letting gravity do the work. It's, they're usually the, some of the cheapest equipment. Okay. Now, continuing with mechanical, um, if the particle now is of the order of 25 micrometer or lesser, the settling rate, you would require huge chambers uh, to settle out the particles. So it's not very uh, feasible from an engineering perspective. So instead, what they do is they would introduce this gas stream tangentially, tangentially into a cylinder. So these particles get introduced tangentially, and they keep start moving in a circular, in a helical form. Uh, so the particles which are, have certain inertia, the elephants, will get thrown outwards radially and get hit against the wall and tend to impact and stay there, whereas the gas is slowly getting cleaned. And then the clean gas goes through a down runner, which looks something like this. Okay? So this goes round and round and round. And each round that it takes, it is throwing out some of the larger particles. And then this tube over here, this pipe over here, it basically the exit is from here. So what you get from get out from here is particles which are of the order of 25 micrometers or so, which have been removed. Okay, so this is called a cyclone. Again, more details are available at this website. Uh, these images, by the way, and the URLs are now free to be used. They are um, they they have copyright clearances, etc. So you're more than welcome to use these slides. Uh, this is again. If you wanted to get a sense of the scales, how big a cyclone would look like, this is a typical industrial scale cyclone. Okay, that's how big it looks. Okay. I don't know if there is a human scale over here, but this seems to be a truck. Okay, this over here is a truck, so you know the scale now. So this is at least six to seven times the height of a truck. Okay, um, let's take a look at the next mechanism. Uh, which is filtration, okay, filtration. And uh, most of us are familiar with filtration, okay? How we are familiar with filtration is because, uh, I don't know if I have a handkerchief. Oh, yes, I do have a handkerchief, okay? So typically, on a dusty road or something like that, you would tend to basically do this, okay? This is what you would use to protect yourself from breathing in a dusty environment, right? Uh, so what happens in this handkerchief is actually filtration. Most of the times you would have probably seen, by the way, it's not sieving. The method is not sieving. Let me just tell you uh, how it is not sieving. So I went to this um, industry one time to, uh, as a part of a training course, and uh, they deal with powders as a product. Uh, some polymeric powders, etc. So I asked them, I said, um, how do you protect yourself? So they said, we have masks which we use. So I said, okay, uh, are they any good? How do you know whether those masks are good? They say, yeah, they're not really good, but what we do is we actually take the mask and we put it in water. Okay, we wet it and then we wear it and then it is more effective. So for me, it was like a little um, un unclear as to how dipping a filter uh, in water would make it more effective. So I told them, I said, why don't you next, for the next class, why don't you bring uh, two masks? Uh, one of them we will take and keep it as is, and the other one we will dip in water and then see what happens to it. So they brought the next day, and what we did was we took the filter, uh, took the mask. These are these normal masks that you would get in the market. You put the mask, it has a little plastic, uh, sorry, uh, uh, an aluminum or clip or a clamp kind of a thing, you can kind of squeeze it so that it fits on your nose. Um, so I took one of these, the dry ones, and we said, okay, let's take a look at the light over there. Let's look to see if we can see the light through there. And you could see some kind of a glow, but you couldn't really see the light. 
Okay? Then we took the other one and we made it wet and removed all the water from it. So it was still wet, but no water dripping from it. So we took this mask and we put it against the light and you could actually, through the holes, see the light that goes that, that, you know, through, the, through the wet filter. So I said, which one now you think is better at filtration? Okay? So the perception that we have that a wet cloth or a wet filter might be better filter is not necessarily true. Because the way the filtration takes place in a fabric material like this is not through sieving. Okay? These are fabric fibrous materials which are crisscross like that. Okay? These are fibrous things. And as a particle is going through, and as, and as ants are going through, so you've got ants going through and you've got elephants going through. Okay? Ants have to be able to pass through. So ants are small. Okay? They'll find this way, that way, this way, that way, and they'll be able to go through. But the elephant has to find its you know, way through these narrow spaces, et cetera, et cetera, and invariably cannot make it through the jungle. Okay? Cannot make it through the jungle of fibers, et cetera, et cetera. So somewhere it gets stuck. Okay? That's the nature of the fibrous filtration. Now, what happens when you wet it? When you wet it, some of these fibers along, they, they just line up with the main thread, and therefore the fibrous surface that was available through which the elephant would have to go through are not available anymore, and there's clear passage for the elephants to go through. Okay? So if you wet it, it is not as fibrous. It's not as, the jungle is not as thick as it would be if it was dry. And when it is dry, then it is possible for it to be able to filter out better. Now, let me just caution a little bit. A wet handkerchief is good. A, a wet handkerchief or a wet filter would be good Provided there is a gas which has affinity for water. Okay? So if there was ammonia somewhere, and I took a handkerchief, and I wet it, and I made two or three layers of it, and I put it against my mouth, okay? then the air that I'm breathing through will have a chance to contact with the water and maybe get absorbed. Okay? So then what comes through is because it's, it's better because the water in the fibers came in contact with the gas, and the gas had affinity for this water, and therefore got absorbed, and therefore didn't go into your nose. Okay? So you want to be able to keep the two separate. We want to deal with elephants, and we want to deal with ants. Okay? Ants you want to take away because they have affinity, because they will dissolve in water. Elephants you have to take care of by putting a big, huge jungle in front of them so that they cannot penetrate through. Okay? All right. So here are some examples. This is typically what a clean filter, clean fabric filter would look like. And these are different gradations of usage after 15 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes, one hour, and this up to maybe about six hours. Okay? This is as bad as it gets, the dirty. This is the black particles over here are particles that got collected as a virt by virtue of um, the filtration. Okay? Um, this is the filter that I talked about. This is the one which if you were to take and put it on your mouth, it has a little elastic strap on it, okay, and it has this aluminum clamp which you can clamp on. But you've got to be careful with this fit, okay? You've got to be careful with this fit because even the smallest hole that might be around it will allow for easier access for, your, for the air that you're breathing, okay? So the greater resistance would be through this filter, so the air would tend to sneak in somewhere. So a lot of times when these masks are being used, um, you know, if you're not careful about the sealing on the mouth, the nose and the mouth area, then sometimes it's just a psychological uh, satisfaction that you're using a mask, but they may actually not be effective. You actually have to make sure that the fit is proper. In fact, most of the time in the industry, when they're using some very elaborate uh, filter, uh, elaborate masks, uh, this is again distinct. Uh, what we're talking about is ambient air quality. Uh, what people are dealing with in the industry is uh, occupational and safety issues. So if a worker has to go into an industry, into a process area, industrial plant, where they actually have to deal with some emissions of ammonia, for example, then they actually have to have a full mask, full face mask, not just the nose and mouth mask, full, full face mask, which basically covers their eyes also. And they actually have different types of masks depending on which one would fit your face structure better. You actually have to pick up Go for a testing to see which of the which of these particular filter, which of these particular mask types fit you better. Okay, 
and uh, because it's a matter of life and death over there, okay? So you, have to, you can't you know, mess around with that. So people actually do the testing. And then once that mask is fit, you have different kind of cartridges that can be replacing, depending on what kind of pollutant you're dealing with. If you're dealing with ammonia, then you'll have a particular kind of cartridge. If you're dealing with sulfur dioxide, another kind. If you have some hydrocarbons, then another kind. So depending on which particular gas you're dealing with, you'd have different kind of cartridges. Here's another example, again, uh, from Google Images. Um, notice that this is, again, a mask, full face mask. It has an elastic band here. And this, these cartridges over here, the pink ones, they're replaceable. Okay? You can remove them. And this typically is a place where the air would come out. So you breathe in through here, and you breathe out from there. And there's a little um, diaphragm disc which opens and closes depending on which way the pressure is. A lot of times, the problem comes in. Uh, you have to breathe through this filter, which means that you really have to. It's almost like saying um, that if I give you a Pepsi, a bottle of Pepsi, and I give you a straw, okay? If I give you a normal size straw, you'll be able to drink easily. But if I give you a very thin straw, uh, then you know you really have to suck very hard uh, for the Pepsi to come into your mouth. So same thing over here. If you put too much filtration around your mouth, it gets difficult to breathe. Okay? The diaphragm would have to exercise extra effort to provide that vacuum for that air to come through. So that is one of the restrictions a lot of times uh, when masks are being used. And there has been some talks about how to uh, force through these filters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but that you know, gets into design of some of these masks, etc. Okay. Um, this is a filter which I'm sure a lot of you would, have been, would be familiar with. Uh, it's used for uh, air intake into an engine into a car engine, and uh, every time, you know, every six months or every one year, when you go to get your car um, um, serve for, for maintenance and servicing, um, invariably there's a charge on your uh, bill that says air filter, and uh, they, you come back home and you open the uh, trunk and you find that there's actually in a plastic bag, uh, they actually have one of these filters which are sitting over there. Um, so, you know, we sometimes look to see whether we can, this is like six months or a year of being on the road, okay, or so many kilometers of being on the road. Uh, so it's, you know, you could actually take a part of this, um, the black stuff that you see over there and do some chemistry on it uh, to see what kind of contaminants are, uh, uh, you know, on the, on the roads uh, in, in traffic and in the highways, okay. Uh, but this is, again, another typical filter. Notice these ribs inside, okay. Notice these ribs. That really is so that in a much, in a very small volume, you can have a large surface area. Okay, so if you have a large surface area, the pressure drop across the filtration unit becomes lesser. Okay, so that's one way of uh, dealing with the pressure drop. Uh, industrially, okay, so these were, you know, this was something that you and I use as personal protection. This is something which is used in cars. But industrially, what do they do in the industry? Okay, uh, what they do in the industry is they have bag houses. Okay, they have bag houses. And what a typical bag house looks like, I apologize for this uh, resolution over here, uh, but that's the best I could find. Um, so you basically would have a cylindrical chamber in which you have these bags hanging. They're just bags that are hanging. They look like socks. Okay? They're made out of fabric material, like cloth material. Uh, it's not just regular cloth. It is special cloth. Sometimes it is polymeric in nature. A lot of times it is uh, designed so that it can take certain temperatures. Okay? Very high temperatures would burn this, so you don't want very high temperatures. But at the same time, you know, if the, um, uh, the gas is coming at, let's say, 60 degrees, 70 degrees Celsius, then at least it should be able to take uh, that temperature. Sometimes even higher. Sometimes they try and keep it above 100 degrees Celsius so that you don't have any water condensation. Okay? So depending on what is your application, you could have different kinds of materials for these bag houses. And the way it works is, that the dirty air would come in over here, and this surface over here is now a filtration surface. So the air, the ants, okay, would penetrate through the filter, whereas the elephants would get stopped outside in the material, and so you will get clean air to come out from here. Okay? So dirty air in, clean air and comes out. Filters, back filters are also, uh, in some sense, used as, uh, they're expensive. They're expensive, difficult to maintain. Uh, after some time, when these bag, bags get choked up, they need to be cleaned. Uh, so there are, you know, it's fairly sophisticated, the, the mechanism, the actual operations and the 
maintenance, some of those issues are quite sophisticated. But it's a good um, device because it actually can remove particles of very small sizes. Okay? So you can go up to 0.1 or smaller micrometer size particles uh, very efficiently. Um, one of the assignments I give in the class is uh, for students to be able to estimate uh, what would be the efficiency of a mask or how would they select a certain filter material to be used in a bag house. Okay? So uh, they then would generate a test aerosol or take smoke or take dust in the air and uh, look to see what is the before uh, particle size distribution or the mask size distribution and what is the size distribution or total mass out after the uh, filter. So those are some of the things that we can uh, get students excited about in the lab work. Okay. So those were methods of being able to remove these particles mechanically. Okay? So we looked at gravitational settling. We looked at cyclones where you increase, use the inertia of the particle to remove it. And then we use filtration uh, uh, in, the, in the form of uh, a fabric or fibrous material through which particles go through. And they're not sieving, one more, to one more time to emphasize. They actually are tortuous paths through which ants and elephants have to go through. Ants can make their way through. Elephants can't make their way through. There's another way of dealing with uh, removing of these particles. It's called a scrubber. Okay? So here what you do is you actually make it contact with the water spray. So you have a chamber in which gas is introduced at the bottom. And from the top, you have these little sprinklers or sprays like you would see in a shower. Just let's just imagine like you know, you're in a shower. But the size of the droplets is much smaller than what you would experience in a shower. Okay, so these are sprays, which are spray nozzles, which are put on top, and they spray the entire uh, cross-sectional area of that cylinder. So as these droplets are coming down, the gas is going up. The gas will have, can have gaseous pollutants as well as particulate pollutants. So as these particles are going up, they're small enough to be carried up by the gas. These droplets, larger droplets are coming down. At some point in time, these particles would come, on tack, come in contact with this larger droplet and therefore get uh, caught, captured. Okay? It would in some way be taken up in that volume of that droplet. So then these particles, no, these droplets would basically take, carry this particle and come down and join the water stream. So in some sense, you have washed in some sense, you have removed the particles from the gas stream by which you're washing the air, okay? washing the gas stream. Another advantage in these scrubbers is that you can actually uh, use this scrubbing also to remove some soluble gases. Okay? So when this droplet is coming down, uh, it is also being passed by ants, and some of the ants may have affinity for water. So for example, if ammonia was there or sulfur dioxide was there, it would have affinity for the water, and by virtue of solubility, it would basically get absorbed. Okay? So that's the advantage. Now, again, a lot of chemical engineering in there. The size of the droplet, the flow rate, uh, what should be the flow rate of the gas such that the water droplet doesn't get carried away by the, by, by the gas stream. Uh, you know, so those are some of the things that would go into the understanding and the design of a scrubber. Uh, nature is a natural scrubber when it comes down to monsoon times. And I don't know about other parts of India, but yesterday we had the first shower. And uh, I don't know how things are going on in Kerala. Uh, apparently, the rain usually comes there 10 days before. So once you get your good showers, and I see you guys coming with umbrellas into the classroom, I will know that showers have started over there. Then I can get my umbrellas out. Okay? But umbrellas, uh, you know, keeping umbrellas aside now, let's just take a, take a look at the rain. Let's get wet in the rain. Okay? So just yesterday's one, maybe probably half an hour, one hour of shower, and suddenly, you know, the air today, the, 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 okay, the sky looks absolutely brilliant blue. Okay? And the trees are looking fresher, and the air is, you know, uh, smelling, uh, uh, you know, like fresh air. You know, Mumbai, that is rare. Uh, okay? So what does rain do? Rain will actually scrub the gas mass which, is, which it is coming in contact with. Okay? Um, so that's one part of what the, uh, um, uh, what did I say, washed, washed ever. What is this? I should be scrub out whatever, right, is in there. I said, washed. So that, I was trying to write wash or whatever. Oh, whatever, okay? <laughs> it is whatever is in the air. So scrub out whatever is in the air. Okay? And the second thing that happens, especially in a country like ours, see, one of the, 
one of the results that keep emerge, keeps emerging from all the studies that we do is that resuspended dust is a big problem okay, in India. Resuspended dust is a big problem, whether it is by winds or whether it is by traffic movement. Uh, you know, the, a lot of times, every time a truck passes by, I think we've talked about this a little earlier too, every time a truck passes by, the smoke that comes out of the exhaust is not as much as the amount of dust that it raises. You know, it's just like a storm at come over, something like that. You know, so the dust in the in the atmosphere, the dust in air in India, a lot of times is an issue, and it contributes greatly to the overall mass of the uh, particulate matter, um, in, 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 even to the PM10 uh, measures. So um, when it rains, this dust actually becomes wet, and then even if a truck is passing by. You may have to be careful that the spray doesn't come onto your white clothes and dirties your clothes, etc. But not these droplets or the kichar or the, the mud, wet mud, basically will not stay suspended long enough in the air. It actually settles out. And they even have these mud guards and stuff like that, which prevents. Um, everybody know a mud guard, right? On a bicycle or on a car or on a truck, they have these mud mud guards. And sometimes, where right under the stop sign, they little have a little rubber hanging, um, you know, uh, flap over there, which actually is an impactor. Okay, for some of you who, you know, you want to see an impactor in real life, that's an impactor. Uh, if somebody has ridden a bicycle sometime and you thought you might be able to go in rain without the mud guard, no, 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 that mud guard has a huge function. If you don't have the mud guard and you're uh, riding in during uh, rain, you know, uh, that uh, the spinning wheel, okay, it actually picks up that little um, mud slurry and it has it aims right at the back of your shirt okay so you get all these droplets on your shirt so coming back to it in terms of the air pollution because the dust has now been wetted it does not get resuspended so I'll, if I get a chance I'll you know show, send you the slides we actually did some uh, studies in Chandrapur where on one day it was dry we took the size distribution and the second day it had rained we did the size distribution again and the larger mode, there are multiple, there were two modes. One was a smaller size mode and the one was larger size mode. The larger mode completely disappeared because all the particles that would have been suspended could not be suspended because it had rained, okay? So um, rain does, rain is a natural scrubber. Okay, uh, here's another example of equipment that is used for wet scrubbing. If you don't want to have just a cylinder with uh, spray, you actually have a venturi scrubber in which the gas stream is brought to a narrower section and then basically expanded again. And in the narrowest section, you introduce the water spray so the contact is highest. Okay? So it increases the efficiency of contact and therefore the removal of particulate matter or gases. Venturi is a subject by itself. Um, you know, chemical engineers, mechanical engineers deal with it all the time. I won't get into the detail, but that's another way of uh, taking. So you take dirty air and you pass it through a venturi scrubber, and then you put it through another cylinder, uh, which is called the demister, because a lot of these droplets themselves can get carried over by, what, by, by the air. So it's not a problem if you introduce, you take away the water droplets, it's just that you would waste a lot of water. So this water droplets settles out in the demister, and you continue to use the same water, okay? All right, so coming back to a review uh, we've dealt with gravity, we've dealt with inertia, we've dealt with diffusion. I think I should add over here uh, the scrubbers, okay? But scrubber is really contact with uh, water, so scrubbers. And then let's take a look at electrical, okay? Now these again, sizes-wise, if you really look at it, this is good for 20 to 100 micrometers, greater than 25, 20, in fact, is too small over here, okay? Particle will take a long time to settle. So anything which is greater than 25, qualifies in the range of 25, qualifies it, qualifies it for a cyclone. A higher investment, a little bit of more energy investment in terms of the, um, um, the, the pressure drop, and therefore you need to drive this through the cyclone. Okay, so some pumping costs are there. A diffusion filter, again, we discussed. So this is good for up to 0.1 micrometers. Good 99.9% .9 removal you can get, provided you're using it properly. Okay, if uh, there's a slight leak, then the a gas stream will not go through the filter. It will find a path of least resistance and therefore just bypass the filter. A lot of time that's an issue with baghouse filters. So anytime there's a baghouse, there's a leak in the baghouse, they have to have a second baghouse standing so that they can immediately switch over the operation to the next one while they repair the previous one for routine maintenance as well as some accidents like that. Okay, the next thing is electrical. 
as we had discussed in the previous uh, class also, uh, electrical mobility, when you take a particle and you charge it, and you put it in an electric field, uh, then there is electrical mobility. Okay, particles tend to move in an electric, charged particles will move in an electrical uh, field. So especially small particles which are not amenable to inertial effects or gravitational effects, and sometimes filtration may be not, uh, you know, filtration can get expensive, and it'll be, uh, you know, the operations may be large enough that it actually can justify a larger capital investment in terms of electrostatic precipitators, then they would use electrostatic precipitators. So the principle of electrostatic precipitator is very simple. You basically take particles, you charge them, and you pass them through a field where this pass through plates which have an electrical field, which tend to attract these particles, and therefore the particles will tend to come and deposit on these plates. Okay, uh, if you go out to the industry, uh, especially a power plant, uh, once in a while you will hear uh, a sound which is tuck, 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 tuck. It's like a knocking sound. Um, you know that uh, electrostatic precipitator is in play because from time to time uh, these plates, these you know, will have a knocker. So basically, it, uh, you know, after every few minutes, it will basically knock on these plates so that all the particles that have, that have deposited on the surface will fall down and get collected, and the surface gets renewed so that more particles can get uh, collected. Okay, so that's electrical precipitator. Okay, again, the size of the electrostatic precipitators can be huge. Okay, so one of the things that happens when you take students for a field visit is that uh, from a conceptual diagram like this one, which we're pretty familiar with from our books, et cetera, and you know, from some of the work that they would have done even at class 11 or class 12. This, everybody understands. You know, it's simple drawing to make. But when it look, comes down to the scale, you know, that's the kind of size that you would have. So these are two electrostatic precipitators, one here, another one here, and this happens to be the chimney or the stack. So this is probably the final last polishing step to clean up the gas before it is let into the chimney, okay? So this is what it looks like. So these are the steps, these are the ladders. So you can get a sense of this is you know, a good two, three uh, stories high. They are huge. And a lot of times electrostatic precipitators, especially in coal power plants, um, they, are, they could be as well as much as 25 to 30% of the to total capital investment. So just th that gives you a flavor of, that gives you a sense of what kind of commitment uh, is there in terms of air quality issues and you know that they cannot go ahead and implement any power plant, uh, install any power plant without uh, having adequate measures. And the kind of investments are of the order of 25, 30% of the total investment for the power plant, okay? Now, what we deal with the uh, ash or what we deal with these particles that are collected, that's now a whole new, whole different solid waste uh, disposal issue um, still, you know, a lot of people are dealing with using part of it as a, part of it in cement, building materials, et cetera, et cetera. Still remains a large issue. Um, and uh, so a lot of these, uh, when, if they're left out in the open, they're very small particles. They're big white mountains. And sometimes if you go to uh, uh, Google Earth and you just zoom in into some of these plants, you will see these huge uh, white piles uh, that can be seen. And they are typically the, the fly ash that is kind of uh, the bottom ashes which have uh, been collected over there. A lot of times they make a pit with fill it with water so that these particles don't get entrained. But disposal is still an issue. That's a different issue. Uh, we won't. Oh, by the way, the same thing holds for water. Okay, when you scrub the gas with water, the pollutants from the air go into the water phase, and now you have to treat that water. So the matter doesn't end with uh, gas being clean now. There is another two, three steps of what are we going to do, deal with, how are we going to deal with this wastewater, how are we going to do, deal with the solid waste that is now uh, left over. Okay, so um, let's just take a quick, quick look at the um, hierarchy, okay, the hierarchy of particulate matter control. You cannot subject a sophisticated control device like electrostatic precipitator or a bag house to large volumes of gas, which have a lot of loading, okay? If there are large particles or if the loading is very high, then you have to use some kind of a gravitational settler or some kind of a cyclone to be able to remove the bulk, okay? You can even use wet scrubbers to remove it. So you have to remove, you have to use the gravitational settlers or the cyclones to remove the bulk 
of the material and then as a final polishing step to be able to make sure that even the smallest particles are now removed because cyclones or settlers will not remove the smallest particles. Even the scrubbers may not be able to remove the smallest particles. And remember, we had talked about this, that smallest particles coming from some of these sources are likely to be more toxic, are likely to actually be able to settle, you know, to actually deposit in your lungs. So we have a concern about particulate matter, which is in the PM 2.5 and smaller range. So the final polishing step, so to say, would come from either filters, which are low in terms of uh, the capital investment, capital cost investment, but high in op operational and maintenance, okay? So therefore, you'd have to choose between filters or you'd have to use between electrostatic precipitators, which are high in capital, but uh, low in the operational and maintenance, okay? Um, comparatively. Of course, both of these are more, much more sophisticated and much more uh, cost uh, intensive uh, compared to these. But as a final polishing step, that is required and it needs to be done. Okay, so that kind of says briefly about how we would deal with particulate matter, or how do you deal with elephants, okay? Uh, now we're going to deal with ants. How are we going to deal with ants? So one thing we talked about a little bit when we were talking about scrubbers is that you can absorb if a particular gaseous pollutant has a certain solubility in water, then you can remove it by bringing it contact with water. Okay, again, chemical engineering operation. Uh, again, I've given this example of a handkerchief. Okay, uh, in case there is pollution, in case there is some kind of a contaminant uh, which might be soluble in water, then a wet handkerchief on your nose would help. Okay, adsorption. I'm sure most of us have dealt with adsorption in class 11 and 12 as a part of physical chemistry, uh, where you would bring the gas in contact with the solid surface, high surface area per unit mass. Uh, activated carbon, for example, is uh, one such material, where uh, organic vapor, for example, would have high affinity. So you use it as a polishing step again. It's also used in drinking water, for example. So after doing all the treatment that you need to do, if you've added um, some, if you want to add chlorine, you would typically add chlorine after this step so that any natural organic matter that still might be in water, you'd be able to adsorb onto the, gravi onto the um, uh, granular activated carbon. And then, so you use adsorption for that. Um, sometimes it gets difficult to give an example of a, but um, there are these, if you go to Google, you'll actually say, you know, uh, portable uh, point of use uh, water filters, okay? Uh, you'd see these jars which actually have a cartridge inside and uh, that cartridge, you fill the water uh, and then when you pour the water th from the jug, it actually goes through that cartridge filter, but that cartridge filter actually has uh, uh, activated a pack of activated carbon uh, and interestingly, it also has a little indicator on top. After a certain volume, of water has been taken through there, then you need to replace that cartridge. Okay, so that's one example that I know. Anything else that one can think of? Um, uh, sometimes they even suggest that in, a, in the refrigerator, if the refrigerator is smelling, uh, that you put um, some charcoal, you know, in a small plate, if you put charcoal, fresh charcoal uh, in the refrigerator, then after some time, the smell uh, in the refrigerator will go away because uh, as a part of the circulation, as it contacts with the charcoal, uh, charcoal tends to uh, adsorb uh, some of these uh, uh, smelly odor um, giving substances. Okay, so that's adsorption. Incineration, okay, let me just go to incineration. I hope, I think I have some slides on incineration. By the way, this is the size of a scrubber. A scrubber can be this size again. Uh, these are some uh, steps over here. These are some steps over here. So this is about at least three to four stories high. Okay. Uh, that's the size of a scrubber, a gas scrubber. Okay. Incinerators. I'm sure you've seen these, okay. I'm sure you've seen these, especially if you're passing by a refinery. Uh, I remember, you know, anytime I would go by train towards Delhi, uh, near Vadodara, there's a refinery. And especially in the middle of the night, it's a very nice uh, sight, actually. You see all these 
uh, light shiny huge plant you see these uh, night lights on but somewhere in one far end there'll also be this flare okay and uh, invariably the question would come to me as to why are they wasting this gas why can't they just use it okay um, the it's an engineering decision that needs to be made uh, that you cannot thermodynamically or from a, just from a process efficiency perspective this is what is left after taking away using the best available control technologies. What is it that you could remove? You've already removed, okay? And this is something that you can't remove anymore. And so you have to get rid of it. You have to dispose it. So instead of disposing it off just directly as a hydrocarbon going into the atmosphere, uh, probably the best thing to do is to burn it, okay? Um, so this seems like a pretty clean flame. Ideally, it should be blue flame, like a Bunsen burner. Uh, but this is not so bad. If you see, go, go again to Google, and you look at incinerators, or you look at flares, or you look at refineries, if you look at some of the images, uh, sometimes you'll actually see smoke which is just pitch black, okay? Just black, totally black. I mean, all you see is black. You don't see any flame at all, okay? Uh, that's not good. That's not good, because our intention was not to convert that gas, that hydrocarbon, and now into soot, okay? That is not the intention at all. But sometimes it happens, especially if there is an accidental release. Uh, then they have to get rid of the pollutants of the hydrocarbons through these uh, incinerator flares. Uh, at that point in time, they have to supply extra air or extra oxygen so that there is sufficient mixing and sufficient combustion taking place so that the flame, as far as possible, is not visible. Okay? If the flame is visible, then there is still some pollution. This one is causing some pollution. It will leave some unburnt hydrocarbons still. Okay, so ideally, there should be a blue, almost transparent flame, like in a Bunsen burner. Everybody, I'm sure, is familiar with Bunsen burner. Uh, even if you know you can't take the students out for a field visit to a refinery or some other place where there's a flare, everybody's familiar with the Bunsen burner. All you need to do is light up the Bunsen burner with the LPG, and if you uh, close the holes, which allow for this extra air to go in, in which gets mixed with the barrel just before. Uh, the, just after the nozzle and before the burn, the place where the flame takes place. If the mixing with the air has happened, then the flame is not yellow anymore. It's a bright blue transparent flame. Whereas if you close those uh, vents, then the air is mixing with the gas in that jet. So that mixing is not adequate, and therefore places where there is not enough air, uh, there'll be zones of incomplete combustion will show up as this yellow flame. Okay? If it is a completely well-mixed combustion flame, then it, you would not see yellow. You would only see um, a blue flame. Uh, same thing for a candle. You see a candle and the light coming from a candle because it is incomplete combustion. Okay? But that's, there's another advantage of that, that you actually have light coming from it, so you can actually see it. If a candle was burning very efficiently, you wouldn't be able to use it as a candle. Okay? All right. So this is what an incinerator looks like in a flare. Sometimes they even have this on a trolley. They'll have it on a truck. And this is taken to a new site where they may be exploring oil. For example, oil drilling is going on all the time. So if they hit gas some point in time, a gas well, then that gas cannot be let into the atmosphere. It actually, be, it actually has to be incinerated. So then they would use this mobile incinerator to do that. OK. Um, I got this is offshore. These are uh, platforms which are offshore oil, we oil wells. And again, you know, if you notice that a little far away from the actual uh, platform where all the operations are going on, there's a certain distance over here. And this distance is kept uh, such that they can flare off some of these gases. Notice these are not good combustion flares. You could actually see the black smoke which is trailing. Okay. So this is not a good example of incineration, but it is still better than disposing of that oil into the, into the, into the ocean. Okay? So, uh, and this is usually far away from populations, so one is hoping that it will get dispersed uh, by the winds in the ocean, etc. But still, you know, if you were, ideally, if you were to look at it, it's not a good thing. But given the circumstance, given the situation, this is probably the best that they can do. By the way, typically, uh, they would have a flare on this side of the platform, and they would also have a flare on the other side of the platform. So in case the wind is in that direction, then they would not use this flare, they would use that flare. Okay? So they actually have to make sure that the flare is uh, 
um, is such that the wind takes it away from the platform. Otherwise, if the wind is in this direction, the flame will start coming towards the process platform, which is not such a good idea. OK. Oh, so um, I'm going to stop here um, for a little bit um, because I wanted to show you, while surfing through Google, I came across this exciting idea of how you can clean up the room in your, the air in your room. OK? It's a fan. And on top of the fan blade, you can actually put this little device, uh, which by virtue of its own circulation, because fan will circulate, so this will circulate with the fan, and it can take away some of the pollutants. Sounds like an interesting project. Uh, I think the dollar value is not very high. It's, I think, only about $3. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. If some of you are interested in doing this experiment, you can take a room and fill it up with agarbatti smoke, and then use this to see whether uh, you know, some of the agarbatti smoke removes. You can have two rooms, one with a fan, which has these, another one which the, with a fan, which does not have these, and you can compare the pollution in those two rooms. So I think I'm, I, I saw this and I thought it was quite exciting, so I should uh, maybe try it out as a part of the lab. Harish, what say? We should try it out in this lab this year, okay? All right, so, so and there are several such exciting ideas. Some of them are feasible, some of them are not feasible, so you really need to look to see, you know, uh, maybe even have students explore whether from an engineering, it's a good idea, but from an engineering perspective, is it feasible or not feasible? Okay, so that is my last slide. I'm going to stop here and uh, take questions. So a big thank you. And I'll come now to interact with some of the, um, some of you. But before we do that, okay, before we do that, I'll give you a minute. I'll give you a minute to stop, pause for a moment, take a piece of paper, and write on it what is it that you can claim to have learned from listening to this lecture today. Okay? Take a couple of minutes and write down what are the things that, some of the things you may have already known, fabulous, great, and some of the things that you said, oh, okay, I didn't know that before, and you can actually claim now that now you know it. Okay? So one of the I do not know has now been converted into now I, now I know. Okay? So please go ahead, take two minutes to do the work in your um, so you could even do it in your notebook, or if you need some paper, uh, request the coordinators to please uh, uh, distribute the paper if needed. If you have a notebook, please go ahead and do it in your notebooks. I'll be quiet for two minutes now. Okay, I think uh, I'm going to open it up for some questions now. So. Gandhi Institute for Technology, where is this? Bhuvaneshwar, okay. Gandhi Institute of Technology, Bhuvaneshwar. Hello, everybody, welcome. All right, very good. Good to see you. All right, so with regard to air pollution control, okay, with regard to air pollution control, one of you please tell me what is it, what is a new thing that you learned today? New thing about control of air pollution. Please be specific to the question, what is the new thing you learned about air pollution control today? Today we could know the different processes that you have delivered, uh, different uh, instruments by which we can uh, use to, uh, for air pollution control, that we could know, and the mechanism also you could deliver properly, uh, we could learn all these things. Sir. Okay, excellent. Is there something sir. that you did not know before, but today, after listening to the lecture, you said, oh, that is a new thing I learned today. Uh, particularly absorption, adsorption, and that charcoal part you have delivered in refrigerator, if you put some charcoal, then the smell comes, uh, that adsorption part, and uh, another uh, uh, incineration that you have. Ah. So that part uh, we couldn't know ah. properly, sir. Excellent. So I have a feeling that you're going to go home tonight and try out this charcoal in your refrigerator, yes? Sir, sir. <laughs> okay, very good. All right, thank you. One more person from here. The interesting part uh, for today's learning was like uh, the teaching strategies for environmental legislation, like the way you taught the things, how to cover it up, and um, like the, how the students will get benefit. I think that is the great learning for me from, the, today, from today's session. Okay, excellent. Yeah, very nicely said because, you know, um, this is really not like a regular class. Uh, you know, you already are teaching this course, uh, you're teaching these co this course already, 
And uh, while I might present some material which might be uh, new, et cetera, it, th these materials are familiar to you. And uh, I think one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, privileges that we have uh, as teachers of this particular training course is that we get to share uh, some of the uh, experiments that we have been doing with teaching, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, you know, thank you for acknowledging that, and I appreciate it. And yes, you know, please, uh, uh, you know, we will learn from each other and continue to be of service to our students, okay? So thank you very much for acknowledging that. I appreciate that. Okay, who else? Now I'm going to move to the next center. Thank you. One, two, nine, six. Where is this? Nagole Institute. Hello, Nagole Institute. Hyderabad. Hyderabad. How are you? Yeah, welcome. Okay, good. So tell me one new thing you learned today. One person, please tell me one new thing you learned today. It was good to learn about the scrubbers, uh, which we have explained uh, for controlling the air pollution. About the scrubbers, air scrubbers. That was good to learn. And the idea of uh, wetting of the handkerchief before you go into the uh, uh, place where it is air polluted, it is a very good idea because uh, in Hyderabad here, there is a very, very uh, high pollution. And uh, the idea of yours, it was very good. And we'll definitely follow that. Yeah. So I just want to caution you a little bit, OK? Uh, handkerchief is not necessarily very effective uh, when you're going on the road, OK? So if you take it like this, and you put it here like this, OK? There is enough space from here, enough space from here, enough space from here, enough space from here, OK? Air will bypass the, so this is just a psychological relief, psychological satisfaction that you might have that you're using this filter. You know, the people actually, I'll maybe share that with you sometime. People have actually developed a nose plug, OK? You can, like earplugs, you actually have a nose plug. You can plug it into your nose and then breathe through it. But the amount of effort it takes to breathe through that nose you know, plug, you, you know, your mouth automatically opens up. It's almost like you have a cold and you know, your nose got blocked. So you stop, sm stop uh, 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 breathing from there. And instead, you start breathing from the mouth. Okay? So there are issues. Unless you have a mask which is fitted to your face, mask will not be effective. It is effective to some extent, but you've got to be careful. You cannot, in a blanket statement, say that all masks are effective. OK? That's one thing. The other thing is, um, if some of you are interested, there has been this interest in developing a crash helmet. See, who gets exposed to the air, the traffic pollution most are people on two-wheelers, scooters, motorcycles. These are the people who get, you know, people on that, they get exposed maximum, OK? And they are required to wear a helmet. So can we actually bring filtered air into the helmet so that they not just have protection of their skull, but also have protection? So that's an idea that we've been floating around for a while. Uh, I'm just waiting to see somebody might snap at it and you know, go do some work. And if you've come across some similar work that has been done, uh, no, please uh, let me know so we can take it further. OK? So OK, thank you very much. One more person from. Nagole Institute, one more person, please speak up. Sure. One more person. Yeah, uh, uh, good morning, sir. Morning, please Actually, tell me uh, one uh, new thing you learned uh, today. Chemical industries were uh, designed with an uh, effluent pump. Yeah, I mean, actually, uh, the clarification regarding the pollutions, when I observed some inter chemical industries in the outskirts were, uh, I mean, designed effluent ponds. Yes. Were really helpful in uh, avoiding the pollution, in the that is air pollution. Affluent plants. I mean, uh, is it uh, really help the? I mean, uh, yeah, if chemical affluent ponds. Yes, yes. So that industrial waste. That yeah, that comes in the domain. See, two things can happen. Okay, you can have a wastewater stream, which needs to be treated. Okay, so that's a wastewater stream which could be coming from many places in the process, uh, but then there could be a waste stream okay. which is coming from a scrubber. Okay, so this way this water was used to remove okay. pollutants from the gas stream. It picked up the soluble gases. It picked up the particulate matter. And now it is coming to a pond, 
where primary settling might take place before it gets treated further. So that effluent pond or the effluent treatment for a liquid stream is now going from the gas stream cleaning up to the now the wastewater stream. Okay, so that's a different game, uh, which Harish will be talking about to some extent in his modules. Okay, all right. Next, next center, please. One, two, one, zero. Belgaum, Gokte Institute. Hello, Gokte, how are you? Hi, everybody. All right, this is a big class. I like it. People at the back are also raising hands. That's excellent. Okay, good. So please tell me one thing that you learned today. Yes, sir. I'll just hand it over to one of my participants. Okay, please. Settlement of dust particles and effect of rain on air pollution. We learned about it. Excellent, excellent. So, you know, I mean, this comes from nature, right? You actually have a spray which is coming from the clouds that can actually clean up the gas, okay? So, thank you. Yeah, very good. Excellent. All right. We move on to the next center now. 1294. Gitanjali Institute. Hello, everybody. Hello. All right. Very good. Sir, good afternoon, sir. Ah, excellent. So, tell me one new thing you learned today. Sir, industrial exhaust gases can be removed by using air house bags and cyclones and also electrostatic precipitators. Which principle is involved working off these devices? That is the, my question, sir. Which Excellent. principle? Generally, huh. uh, sir, which type of, which principle is involved for the purification of exhausted gases? That is my question, sir. Exhaust gas from where? Which principle, sir? Which principle is based? Yeah, These so, devices are working. So every source will have sir. different composition of exhaust. So which exhaust are you talking about? Which source? Adsorption or uh, adsorption process or uh, just uh, suppose if neutral particles are present in industrial exhausted gas, how to remove the by using electrostatic precipitators? Yeah, I'll, I'll try and answer your question to the degree that I've understood, okay? Um, so you should know that each industry would have a different exhaust composition. So for example, what's coming from a cement plant, what's coming from a coal-based power plant, what's coming from a refinery, each one of them would be different. So if you have to remove particles which have come from coal combustion in a power plant, then you need to know the composition of the gases and the particulate matter coming from the burning in the combustion zone. So when you know what's coming out, accordingly, you can either put cyclones, you can put scrubbers, you can put uh, electrostatic precipitators, okay? So the, uh, the, the choice of the equipment has a lot to do with what is the composition of the gases what is the size distribution? What is the temperature of the gases that are coming out? Okay, so those are some of the uh, design parameters that are given to the uh, chemical engineers to say, look, this is the typical range of concentrations of these particular pollutants that are going to be coming in this exhaust, and we need to be cleaning it to this particular level because our State Pollution Control Board tells us that we cannot allow pollutants beyond this level. So between what's coming in and what needs to be released, I have to do my job with the control devices. Okay, So that's a long answer to your short question, but the answer has to be very specific to the particular source, to the particular industry that you're dealing with. Okay, So fabulous question. Thank you very much. We will keep participating. All right, so it's 12.30, time for lunch. Thank you very much, uh, Gitanjali Institute. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Gitanjali. Bye-bye. Okay. All right, and bye-bye to everybody else of the 151 centers. I will see you tomorrow, but you will have a lecture this afternoon starting at 1.30. Okay? Go have a great lunch. I'll catch you. Bye-bye.